It's not too late to make someone's holiday season a special one. Start now as an Amazon delivery station warehouse associate to earn some extra money for the holidays. You'd help bring joy to thousands near you by preparing packages and loading them up for their final delivery. With night and early morning shifts available through the new year, you'd also have the flexibility to spend time with your loved ones. To start as a delivery station associate, go to Amazon.com slash holiday work. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. More than one in three people will face cancer in their lifetime. Unfortunately, fear can stop you from getting your cancer screening, but it won't stop cancer. Early detection can save your life. Don't wait for symptoms to appear to act. Cancer screening is safe, effective, and accessible for everyone, including free or low-cost screening programs. Go to cancerscreeninfo.com right now for free screening resources and recommendations from the American Cancer Society. Don't wait. Early detection can save your life. Go to cancerscreeninfo.com today. Cancerscreeninfo.com. Com. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. This was the crisis of Jonathan's life. What was to be his attitude towards the one who had suddenly surpassed and overshadowed him? Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history in a sermon that they delivered today. We're hearing a sermon from D.E. Host. It was preached probably in the early 1900s, just after the turn of the century. Joel, D.E. Host, Dixon Edward Host, is uh, he's not a famous man an example of proof that he is not a famous man. And there may be somebody listening who goes, I know all about DE Host, what are you talking about? But the proof that he's not a very famous man is when I was doing research for this episode, it was actually very difficult to do research on this guy. And this guy lived in the 1900s. He dies in around 1946. So, I mean, it's not like he's that long back. Um, there was a biography I could use. So there was some information I was able to put together in this episode. But I, it's just surprising to me how many times really important people, we just kind of lose track of them. There's a pretty good chance that you clicked on this episode and you it was one of many people, if you listen to Revive Thoughts a lot, where you're like, I don't know who this person is, but I guess I'm here to find out and it's going to be interesting for me. And that's just something that is a theme in Revive Thoughts. We have so many sermons and giants in church history to look up to. Men like D.E. Host, who I think when you're done with this episode, you're going to have a lot of respect for him. Yet they help change the world, but we've completely forgotten about them these days. D.E. Host uh, may not be a man that you are familiar with, but but he helped preserve the legacy of a man I'm going to guess that you are familiar with, Hudson Taylor, one of the most famous missionaries that ever lived who helped found the China Inland Mission. D.E. Host was the man who took over after he did, who ran it for almost 40 years and helped it see through uh, just a brutal, a bunch of different things that went on. We'll talk about it in a minute, but just between a civil war that was happening, the Japanese invasion, D.E. Host helped see through some of these issues and some of these Um, really rough moments. And yet, again, not a man that you probably have heard of before this moment. Yeah, it's really interesting. I actually found this, uh, the backstory and the, all the, the background of this episode, really fascinating. Just another example of those instances where there's people that are so fundamental to what we look at and understand church history to be nowadays that uh, we don't know anything about, but they, you know, without them, church history probably wouldn't look anything like it does now, and yet they go invisible behind the scenes sometimes. And so I would definitely describe D.E. Host as someone that was, you know, behind the scenes in church history that that helped make it what we understand it to be today. Uh, We're going to England, where he was born in 1861. He was the son of a major general. So he's coming from this military family uh, with military rules, and it was a God-fearing family, a very Christian family with strong biblical teachings. But Host was not a particularly joyful child. He told his friends later that he remembered very few moments of joining in on the joy that his family had uh, when he was a kid. He didn't express himself very well emotionally. He was very reserved. He was very quiet. He was very shy. Uh, He was brilliant. He was smart. He learned Greek at the age of nine. He liked poetry here and there, but in general, um, people kind of referred to him as being detached and disinterested in things. I'm sure 
if he was born today, there would be a you know a, a list of classifications or designations we would give his personality and whatever it may Honestly, be. Honestly, it's funny you say that. That was the exact same thought. I, I didn't put it in the script, but I was thinking the same thing. I was like, man, I wonder what, you know, some counselor or someone would definitely right. put some disorders on him for this kind of just, you know, d- apathetic behavior he had. Yeah, yeah. But back then, yeah, you know, late 1800s, that you were just a person. You were just an odd guy. Um, but it... <laughs> But at the age of 17, he enrolled in the army, and he learned how to lead and how to command. And when he was 18, he joined his dad's regiment, because his dad's a, a general, right? D.E. Host became an artilleryman. In 1879, at the age of 18, everything changed for him when his brother became a Christian. And how many times lately have, and I feel like this has happened a lot in the recent episodes, if you're looking for other themes in our show, this is another one, where a family member's faithfulness pushes another you know, sibling to Christ. We had that in the Robert Murray McShane story. I, I know that one. We had it. I feel like we had it in Thomas Chalmers' story as well. And now here it is coming up again in D.E. Host. Uh, a sibling came to Christ at a D.L. Moody kind of, uh, you know, tent revival, and he insisted. He was just 100%, you have to. I will not take no for an answer. You know, you are coming with me to his next tent revival. Uh, host gets there and immediately uh, he is feeling convicted. He is feeling moved. He's eating up the entire revival service, the whole prayer meeting. D.L. Moody is leaving, leading. But it wasn't until the very last day when he fully surrendered. He felt like there was just this fight in him that he, he wanted whatever was going on here, but he didn't want to fully let go and trust God. He was scared. And finally, he said that last evening at the last service, Moody was just basically like, it has to happen now. And Host, you know, gave in, fully surrendered himself to God and said he felt for the first time the forgiveness of God for his many, many sins. He told the other army officers what had happened, and they didn't really seem too interested. But when he got baptized, then they really started to treat him differently. And when he quit smoking, then they really started to treat him differently. Uh, But he said he didn't care. He began reading his Bible just super earnestly. He was visiting with the other Christian soldiers, and they would go out to the poor parts of town and share the gospel with people in neighborhoods. And he was just becoming a very different person than the one he was before. Yeah, and this uh, evangelistic ministry put him in contact with a student from Cambridge. And Troy, we didn't discuss how we're going to pronounce this. What, what's your best crack at this? Oh, this has got to be Montague Beauchamp. Beauchamp? Those... Right, yeah, Beauchamp. Beauchamp. I like it. No, I can get behind that. Montague Beauchamp, right? Beauchamp soon afterward found out about Hudson Taylor's work in the China Inland Mission. And this, because this is all going on about the same time in the late 1800s, and he told Host about it. So these two friends are talking about what Hudson Taylor's doing out in China there. In 1884, Host actually was able to meet Taylor, and he told Hudson Taylor about his desire to go to China with the CIM. However, Taylor suggested um, that he get a little bit more practice evangelizing and doing ministry first, and which in general I think is probably... It's it's good uh good advice for anyone interested in missions. It's like get good at doing missions where you're you know get good at reaching people or or evangelizing to people where you're at first. You know it's it, we don't really know why Taylor had that advice for him. He may have been partially concerned because Host uh, was a, a relatively shy gentleman. He was yeah he had a really high pitched voice. But with Taylor's recommendation, uh, Host went to go work with D. L. Moody in his campaign, helping those who had questions about coming to Christ after these revival meetings. And so he would kind of be a helper that could talk to these people and share the gospel with them after D.L. Moody spoke during these revival meetings. Finally, in 1885, Host joined Beauchamp and five other men from Cambridge. And they went to China, Call they they had this name, the Cambridge Seven was kind of the, you know, that would be the movie title of uh, of their group, right? The Cambridge Seven, a, a bunch of college friends that felt called to China and went to China. You may have heard of the Cambridge Seven before. C.T. Studd is one of probably the most famous guys from that group. Uh, All of them would actually be, they were big names. Uh, And and in a lot of ways, Host was kind of the, uh, you know, the odd pick, right? He was kind of the guy at the bottom of the list that maybe you were expecting things from. Uh, The other guys were already doing great stuff where they were in in this. And again, you, you probably haven't heard of Host. You may have heard of actual other members of the Cambridge Seven. And when they get to China, ministry in China is tough. The language is hard to learn. The people at this time were very hostile, and they would sometimes just outright persecute them. Uh, Host felt quite inferior, as he was not naturally a great speaker, 
and didn't really improve when he got overseas. He still struggled to speak in front of crowds and to speak to the people, uh, not to mention he was often assigned to work at a refuge for opium addicts after the opium war, and Britain you know, got a bunch of people in China addicted to opium so they could sell it to them, a terrible situation. Well, years later now, we're in a situation where the Christians are opening these opium refugee, refuge centers to kind of help these people come out of that addiction, and here he is, host, working with these people. It's not exactly something he's ever been trained in probably to do before. You could imagine how difficult that might be, you know, going to a city center in your own town and trying to work people off of drugs. Now put yourself in a completely different country with a completely different language. And you can see how that would just be a really challenging uh, situation to be in. He, again, he also was working with some of the greatest ones while he felt inferior. They could speak and draw these big crowds, but he, he was usually kind of assigned to, you know, giving out tracks or having the one-on-one -on -one conversations because that was a little bit what he was better at. Eventually, he ended up being the only man in his city. All the others had been moved on, and he was eventually the last guy in the city with a famous uh, kind of indigenous Chinese pastor who everyone thought he was going to be great. He'd been ordained. He was con he's considered a success story of being like a Chinese pastor taking on the role. He was a little bit hot-headed, not the easiest guy to get along with. Host recognized early and believed that the churches should be run as possible, as much as possible by the Chinese people themselves. He also encouraged uh, something new at this church and then this town, which was not to use the new converts to evangelize, but to build them up in the faith first before sending them out. Usually when the China Inland Mission showed up in a spot, they'd convert people and then they send the converted people right back out to bring in new people because, look, this person's changed, but these people knew so little about the faith they were suddenly asking people to come to. That was a problem. And Host recognized, like, these are not the best people to send. The frontline workers shouldn't be made up of baby converts. It should be made up of people we built up first. And so he was in a lot of ways. People studying him later and people listening to him later were like, no, this Host guy, his plan for the city was decades ahead of the people around him because he started to realize maybe the problems and maybe you know it's me just thinking this off the cuff but maybe part of the reason host realized the problems is because he wasn't drawing big crowds so he could kind of sit back and look at the whole structure and go okay like yeah you drew a hundred people to hear you speak but you know how many of them actually stuck with it and stuff like that maybe he was kind of in the background analyzing the success fullness of the whole movement. I'm not sure. Host had to overcome all of these feelings of inadequacy and do what God had called him to do where he was. So he formed a good and lasting relationship with this Chinese pastor. They became very close, very good friends. And even though this guy was, you know, a newbie on the scene, he had just gotten here. He wasn't the best guy and he wasn't the best at the job. He was a true friend who gave up a lot to take care of this pastor. And so they actually became quite close throughout the rest of their life. He also would constantly check in on other people. He was always writing letters, just checking in, how you doing, how are things going over in yours, you know, where can we be praying for you, that kind of stuff. He became the rare missionary who kind of got along with pretty much everyone. Even when other mission groups and missionaries were kind of at odds with each other, even when they were at odds with host himself, he always found a way to end, thing on, end things on good terms so that they could still get along. They might have been enemies, but they weren't going to be at each other's throats kind of enemies. And uh, it's just interesting how God took this guy who couldn't figure out what he was supposed to do, who was once the lonely, shy, unable to express himself kid, and made his skill set the guy who could glue all these relationships together, the networker kind of guy, the guy who's in there pulling all these strings and keeping, pe keeping people in contact because of his genuine desire to see how everyone was doing. It just, he really transformed him away from that young kid who couldn't get along and turned him into the guy who's, you know, in a lot of ways, the guy you expect to check in on you. So in 1890, there was this girl named Gertrude that uh, he was all about. Uh, and he's 29 at this <laughs> point. <laughs> he, he is all about. And he tries to woo her. He tries to confess his feelings to her. And he proposes to her. But she's becoming very sick at this point, And she actually goes back to the UK to recover and ends up declining his proposal, which I'm sure is very heartbreaking. And I don't know if it's, you know, because of she she wasn't into him at that time or whether... Um, she thought she was going to die, you know, back at, she needs to go back home to recover from this illness. And it's just not a good time to, to handle that, whatever it may be. Um, she declines his proposal. It would be three more years before he actually saw her again, because she's back home. He's out doing this work. Um, but eventually, and again, we don't have a, a whole lot of details to see how they got, uh, this all got around, but, um, she, she was okay. <laughs> she, she was down to marry him at that time, these three years on. Uh, I guess they've they kind of shifted where they're at in life, and she was feeling better. 
and they got married. They had three boys together, and they're going through life with, with their little family there. And he was speaking at this big conference in Shanghai, and we've covered some of these conferences before. You know, Hudson Taylor would, would speak at them as well, and so he's right there next to Hudson Taylor as far as on scale, as far as what's going on. And, and this is the kind of the first record we see of him doing a, a public speaking presentation that uh, he, he nails it. He kills it. From all accounts, the, the audience, his hearts were gripped. Uh, many years of experience paid off as, as someone who had worked with growing disciples in China and working with it, locals and individuals in China, his principles helped people realize that they need to grow local Chinese pastors in the areas. And it was a really successful presentation that was really well received. But shortly after this, host himself would get sick and need rest. And uh, his wife and son couldn't travel with him. So he had to go back to the UK while his family stayed in China. And after some time in the UK, he wasn't improving at all, and so his doctors sent him to Australia to get better in the, in the good old Australia dry air. Hello, this is Discover, and we take customer service very seriously. We know that if you have a question or concern about your credit card, that's a serious matter, and you need to talk to a real person about it. So we offer around-the-clock access to seriously talented representatives in the USA. Again. It's a serious endeavor. The only funny thing about it is Bob. If you call us and Bob answers, you're in for a treat. Get 100% U.S.-based customer service and talk to a real person day or night. Discover exceptionally common sense. It's not too late to make someone's holiday season a special one. Start now as an Amazon delivery station warehouse associate to earn some extra money for the holidays. You'd help bring joy to thousands near you by preparing packages and loading them up for their final delivery. With night and early morning shifts available through the new year, you'd also have the flexibility to spend time with your loved ones. To start as a delivery station associate, go to amazon.com slash holiday work. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. Host was put in charge of a district when he finally got back and reconnected with his family. He actually did not give many orders. When he was he was known as somebody who kind of came in and said, I like what you're doing. Let's just keep what we're doing and do it better. You know what I mean? Um, and his, But his character, his heart, made it clear to everyone where his priorities were. And the people said they wanted to work harder for Host, not because of you know, any speeches or anything he said or did, not that he was doing anything wrong, but they just, they really loved the person. And so that motivated them to, you know, do their best. If that mean, don't want to let host down, we got to do our best here. Uh, his character and heart made it clear to everyone what he was about. What he was about was uh, he, he really loved Jesus and he really wanted others to, and he also really honored the Chinese people and wanted them to be honored. Now, while he's running this district and things are going well, a big problem happens. The Boxer Rebellion breaks out in the year 1900. This thing is a complete is a complete mess. It sets everything back. Um, many Christians and Europeans are straight up attacked, and all the mission stations are kind of, you know, they're going through problems. This will be a huge setback to the China Inland Mission, and Hudson Taylor is not in town. I actually read not that long ago Hudson Taylor's autobiography and his description of this moment of hearing about the Boxer Rebellion, getting all these telegrams of like so-and-so missionary has been killed or so-and-so mission stations on fire and just that it was completely overwhelming. And he he's not there to help. Like he can't do anything. He's in Europe at the time on a kind of sabbatical that he had planned to take a long time ago. And this could not have fallen on the China Inland Mission in a way at a worse time. But then maybe it could have actually happened, you know, it ha everything happening for the work of God's good, because it forced Hudson Taylor to make a quick decision of he needs a successor, someone on the ground who can deal with this rebellion. And there were a couple of different people, but he chose D.E. Host to be the guy who would take the China Inland Mission, as Hudson Taylor is now kind of too old to do it. And Host originally rejected, he said, you know, this is too great an honor for a guy like me, there's no way I could do this. But when he got to work, he got to work and worked hard, saved lives, spared people, did everything he could to protect the mission. And even though many stations had trouble, ruins, it was a whole mess, property damaged, I mean, people killed, it was a disaster and, and a very huge cataclysm. Eventually it ended. It took years, but it ended. And Host, you know, working hard, working with the people, was able to keep it going. After it was over, Britain asked China, saying, hey, you need to pay 
the China Inland Mission back because, you know, China Inland Mission lost a lot of lives. You owe the money for that, obviously. You, you burnt stations. You stole property. Like, this was a huge disaster, what you did to all of us. And you owe the China Inland Mission a lot of money. But when that happened, the China Inland Mission under host, host said no. Don't. Nope. No, we're not taking any payments from China. We're not going to take a payment from a defeated nation here. This is not happening on our watch. They said, we're more interested in seeing Chinese souls come to life. You know, we're more interested in being able to evangelize. And if we take money from them, that's just going to put us at odds. Even though it hurts what they did, you know, in the future, decades from now, we'll have kind of forgotten what happened here. But we'll be able to plant seeds for future churches. And that really gave, I think, a lot of respect to people. People were really impressed that China Inland Mission did that. And yeah, it was a huge loss, a huge setback. But over time, they regained that ground, sent missionaries back out, and were able to rebuild back into those districts that they had been pushed out of. Um, and it was just all this focus on we're going to bring people to Christ, not worry about the buildings that we lost. He would leave for 35 years. So he took over kind of in a disaster, right? Could have been easy for him to just take over temporarily, but he would lead until the year 1935. And there are many ups and downs during that time. You know, and when there were some weird situations too, like in 1922, they joined this kind of international Christian ecumenical group where all like the Christian groups in China were kind of getting together. But very quickly, they realized the whole group was kind of being run by theological liberals. They had some tiffs and fights. And finally, in 1926, China Inland Mission said, we're out. We're just, we're just not on the same page. We're not going to get along and we don't agree with the way you're doing things. Um, and so they pulled out of that. They didn't stick with it. Then in 1926 and 1927, China Inland Missions were pushed out during this giant, uh, push of anti-Christianity that happened, and all of them were kind of pushed out of the inland and back into the coastlands. Uh, but Host kind of oversaw this, and he said, hey, let's use this opportunity to get our Chinese indigenous pastors that we've been working on to take over those churches we left behind. You know, he, he was always looking for the positive that could be in that negative situation. And then 1929, famously, as world history tells you, the Great Depression hit and China Inland Mission declared, you know what, instead of worrying about money or worrying about how we're going to make ends meet or where our donors are going to do, we're going to boldly proclaim that God is going to have us send 200 new missionaries out this year. We're not only not going to lose anybody, but we're going to send more out. And they did. They had, By the end of about a year, they had, I think it was two years, they had 200 new missionaries and actually opened 80 new outposts in places that no one had ever been before, including tribes way out there in China that no one had ever been able to reach before. Um, and finally, in 1935, he will retire. He's done everything he can, and host lets you know go. We skipped over. I'm sure there are just tons and tons of stories that he lived through. But again, his the research on him is not really well done outside of the biography I found about him. He's a quiet life. You know, his 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 journey of running China Inland Mission for 35 years is actually not something that there's a whole lot of information out there on. But in 1937, which should have been, you know, the quiet times of him retiring and living his life, uh, again, if you know World War, World War history, world history, Japan invades China starting World War II, at least here. And, and yeah, China, Japan had kind of invaded China in different parts of China, but this was the full frontal attack on China. And Host and his wife are taken to a Japanese internment camp by the end of the war, um, and she won't come back out. Gertrude will not make it out of the internment camp. Uh, Host will. But Host, by the end of his life, was suffering from what he called memory loss. He was not as sharp as he used to be. He he was really, really struggling to remember things as well. And uh, even though he comes out of the camp, the camp only exacerbated what was already kind of a really rough situation for him. Um, but he would go to the UK to f spend his final year in the United Kingdom. He, he definitely kind of had some dementia or something going on there, though. But he did get some visitors from, I believe, the China Inland Mission kind of checked in on him one last time. And he didn't know anything. He really didn't remember who he was. Um, he even said a comment basically like, you know, I'm glad I was never a family man because I was too busy doing things or something like that. And he would run kind of fake council meetings still kind of, he's just completely out of it. But then he just stopped and he looked at them and he goes, you know, what really keeps me going, what gives me hope is that I, I can see the vision of Jesus Christ. I know his love. I know his face on the throne. I know it's going to be okay. And so he may have lost track of everything else. He may have even truly forgotten his family. But the, the, the love of Jesus, the, the glory of Jesus was still alive in his heart when he, uh, when he went on to die. So many people thought that after Hudson Taylor died, that the, thought that the China Inland Mission would, would go away, right? Many great organizations went away after their founder died. And Host, who had been put in charge of it unexpectedly and who was originally not skilled to run it, he didn't seem like a man who could run it. 
Yet, if it wasn't for Host and his skills running the CIM and the way that God used the once shy and reserved man, we may not really remember much about who Hudson Taylor was today and many others. Part of the reason we know Hudson Taylor is because of the man who replaced him and kept all of his work going through so many trials so well. In this sermon, Host talks about Jonathan giving up his duties and honors so that God could be glorified. And it seems a very fitting sermon to someone who gave up everything himself. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 4. The significance of this action on the part of Jonathan can only be fully appreciated by consideration of the events in his life as recorded in the previous chapters of this book. It will be remembered that in the 14th chapter is given the account of one of the most remarkable deliverances ever wrought on behalf of Israel. The Philistines had invaded the country in overwhelming force. The armies of Israel were not only completely subdued and disorganized, but were even deprived of their weapons of war by the conquerors. Never, perhaps in the history of the chosen race, do we find them in a more hopeless and humiliating position than that described in the closing part of the 13th chapter. So complete was the disarmament that swords remained only in the hands of Saul the king and of Jonathan his son. Then follows the wonderful story of how, through the faith and courage of the young prince, the whole aspect of affairs was completely changed in the course of a few hours. The country was rid of the presence of its hated oppressors, their yoke broken, and the national honor and independence once more secured. It can be seen that at once that Jonathan must have been the hero of the hour and that the eyes of the whole nation must have been turned in gratitude and loyal devotion towards him and great and glorious career lay before him. He was their heir to the throne and had proved himself worthy to occupy it whilst the hopes of Israel were fixed upon him. Soon afterwards, a sudden and great change takes place. In an hour of threatened national danger and dishonor, another individual unexpectedly achieves a great victory, and at once the enthusiasm both of the army and of the people at large becomes centered upon David. This was the crisis of Jonathan's life. What was to be his attitude towards the one who had suddenly surpassed and overshadowed him? There could be no more searching test of character. It is not easy for anyone to find his prospects of influence and usefulness interfered with by the appearance of another upon the scene. The natural spirit of self-assertion is too apt to rebel against what seems to be a usurpation of one's own rights. Alas, how easily the deadly seeds of jealousy and unkindness germinate in the heart under such circumstances. Judged by the ordinary standards of the world, the career of Jonathan might be said to have ended prematurely in failure and with the splendid prospects of his early manhood unrealized. Estimated in the light of God's word, its value and significance are far otherwise. The lesson which it teaches us is perhaps best expressed in the words of our Lord, he that loses his life will save it. The real worth and completeness of a career cannot be reckoned in the light of its outward circumstances. Apparent failure may mean the deepest and most lasting success. In other words, it is the spirit in which the life is lived which is the essential point. 
It is characteristic of the Holy Scriptures to be silent concerning the inward conflicts through which Jonathan must have passed in connection with his relationship with David. It is enough to know that he was a man of like passions with ourselves and that, therefore, he must have realized fully and keenly all that the acceptance of David as God's appointed man involved to himself. It would be a complete mistake to regard Jonathan as a mere weak, sentimental, immature youth for whom prospects of great position held no attraction. The account already referred to of the national deliverance wrought by the Lord through him sufficiently shows the fallacy of such a view. No, the secret of Jonathan's action lay in a deep subjection to the will of God and in the habit of communion with the Lord, which produced in him a humble, unselfish spirit. Hence, when this supreme and searching test of his life came, he met it in the right way. We who are God's children in the present dispensation are accustomed to regard ourselves as living on a higher plane than did his servants in the Old Testament times. And there is, of course, scriptural ground for our doing so. And yet, as we contemplate this act of Jonathan's and consider his subsequent relationship with David, oh, may we not take shame to ourselves for our slowness to Let the mind that was in Christ Jesus be in us and to make ourselves of no reputation in order to make room for the gifts and ministry of others. Let us remember that God's arrangements for the cooperation of his servants in his work will be contrary to the mind of the flesh in each one of us, simply because they are in accordance with the mind of Christ. And as the Lord seeks to lead us, each one, into a truer and purer fellowship with himself, we will most certainly find that the path opened before us involves an ever-deepening and fuller measure of death to self and self-seeking in its manifold forms, our relationship with others will be increasingly that of the bondservant who is expected to sacrifice himself and his interests on behalf of those whom the Lord appoints him to serve. It is a solemn truth that any refusal on our part to allow this spirit practically to govern us of necessity means hindrance to the Lord's plans and loss to his work. It is sadly possible to seek our own even while there may be a considerable measure of honest zeal and devotion to the service of God. May we all have grace to perceive and loyally to respond to every fresh call which the Master may make upon us to go forward in the path of self-emptying. As we do so, we will win Him in ever-increasing measure, and the quality of our life and service will correspondingly improve. There are so many people in church history that we do not remember the names of, and I I would imagine many of you probably did not know or did not know much about D.E. Host before this episode. And yet, I think this sermon of his is so fitting. It's a sermon talking about how great it was that Jonathan stepped out of the way for David, right? A man who didn't, who could have been, I mean, Jonathan was a famous guy at his time. He was a big deal. And he, in a lot of ways, could have argued, I had the right to that throne. But he stepped aside for God. He stepped aside for a love for a, for a brother. He stepped aside for his trust in God's plan and knowing that as great as it would be to be number one, it's okay to go away and let God have that throne. Because ultimately, that is who is number one. And I think 
DE host, the fact that you don't know his name, but you know his founder's name, the fact that he did such a good job of preserving Hudson Taylor's legacy, but didn't make so much of himself, even though he did a lot of great things too. I, I wonder, I, th I think this is actually really applicable in our day and era. I think it's a real challenge to so many in ministry or outside of ministry who look around themselves maybe on social media or wherever. So many people want to be that famous guy. So many people want to be that person that everyone's following, who, who everyone wants to have the opinions of. How many of us have the faith in God, have the desire to love like God, that we would step aside that we would be like Jonathan or Dehe host and just do what we're supposed to do and not worry about making sure our name was famous at the end and not making sure whether we're remembered, but focusing on making sure that Christ is remembered. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was preached by Pastor Bill Clear of Open Door Baptist Church. If you would like a Revived Thoughts branded shirt and or mug and or stickers, uh, check out the link below in the description for uh, our merchandise store. I can't guarantee it'll be here for Christmas, but it might be. I don't know. You never know. Another idea for Christmas, maybe you're like, hey, I've already bought a bunch of shirts, which probably haven't. But if you have... And you're thinking, I need to get something else for my favorite church history lovers. Why not a old-fashioned Patreon subscription, right? Why not get them the good deep dives? Help them out with those. Joel and I can officially say we've started cracking ground. We are in the process of working on the next deep dive now that we've got a lot of things caught up from this move to Cambodia. And it's very interesting. I think it'll be an episode on a subject you have definitely never really read about or even maybe even thought about before. So I'm very excited to bring this episode that we're working on. I'm not quite yet ready to announce it because I'm very excited about it. But we've got a deep dive coming. We have three other deep dives on Joan of Arc, the First Crusades, and the Salem Witch Trials, and we highly recommend them. Each of those deep dives is well over an hour. The First Crusades is like two and a half hours of just full-on content details and stories that you would not believe. Every time we put them out, people message us and go like, I cannot believe that story is true. And so you've definitely got to go check those out. Plus, you can get all of our advertising free feed so you can listen to Martyrs and Missionaries and Revive Thoughts with no advertisements from here out. And also, you will get access to other things that we are working on, plus a bookmark, no longer personally signed because I am not there to sign them, but you do get our bookmarks and some other goodies like that. So go check it out or give it to somebody else as a nice gift. Maybe they would enjoy it. Maybe it's something you can give to them. This is Troy and Joel, and you're listening to Revive Thoughts. Hello, this is Discover. And we take customer service very seriously. We know that if you have a question or concern about your credit card, that's a serious matter. And you need to talk to a real person about it. So we offer around-the-clock access to seriously talented representatives in the USA. Again, it's a serious endeavor. The only funny thing about it is Bob. If you call us and Bob answers, you're in for a treat. Get 100% U.S.-based customer service and talk to a real person day or night. Discover exceptionally common sense.